Hey everybody, welcome to CAF World War II, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. World War II is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird movement more than 65 years ago. And thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. Good evening and welcome everyone. This is episode number 112 of Warbird Tube. And tonight we are going to uncover some little known stories of women in World War II. Now, before we get started, please do us a favor. If you haven't already done so, please take a second to like, share, or subscribe, and make sure that you follow us. And if you do subscribe on YouTube, click the bell icon, and you'll get notifications about new episodes of Warbird Tube when they are posted. Now, as you're watching tonight, if you have any questions for our guests, just type them in the comments section. We'll try to answer them either during the presentation or before we sign off this evening. Now, joining me is uh, author... Mary K. Eater, and uh, Mary is a retired U.S. Army Major General, and uh, Mary, I believe this is the very first time we've had a uh, Major General on the show. Welcome, and we're going to talk about the book, The Women Who Stepped Out of Line. Good evening. Good evening, and I'm so happy to be here, and relieved I actually got to make it. <laughs> yeah, you may notice that we, we don't have cameras on uh, tonight. Um, that's because uh, Mary's uh, computer has decided that it's going to hold its breath. And it, it's giving her the infamous blue screen. So we're going to go old school tonight with uh, being able to watch the uh, the presentation. But you'll be able to hear us uh, throughout the presentation. And again, if you have questions, please please let us know. Uh, Mary, tell us a little bit about about your time in the uh, in the army. You've had uh, quite a career. Well, I was in the army for 36 years. I decided I'd join for three, stayed for five, active. Spent some time then in the reserves, and then after 9-11, came back to active duty. So I had an incredible adventure, or many adventures, mostly in Europe, although I had been to Korea, and I've certainly had the grand tour of the Middle East. So I've been very fortunate to have amazing experiences, meet great friends, and learn so much along the way. And what the, the book that you wrote is not necessarily military-based. So what was the idea be, behind the book? What was, I don't know, the, the first story you discovered or, or what gave you the, the thought that this is something that people don't know about? Well, it was something I didn't know about. And certainly okay. in 2017, I was asked to speak at a leadership conference for the Army. And I was a substitute. I was a last-minute ad. Uh, the main speaker had dropped out. So I had two weeks to prepare. And I had found a couple of stories from obituaries. I know how that sounds. You read a, mm -hmm. reach a certain age, you read obituaries. But these were the greatest generation leaving this earth now in greater numbers. And one of the first ones I found was the story of Stephanie Check Rader, who had been with the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, from the Women's Army Corps, and she became a spy. And I was fascinated with her story, and I kept it and saved it. And then I began to collect others. Didn't know what I'd do with them up until 2019 when I was watching the Emmy Awards and Alex Borstein from Mrs. My Maisel, Maisel Maisel, yeah. accepted the award for Best Supporting Actress. And when she stood up to accept that award, she said, in World War II, my grandmother was about to be shot into a pit. And she turned to the guard and said, well, what happens if I step out of line? And he said, well, I don't have the heart to shoot you, but somebody will. She stepped out of line. And for that, I am here today. And for that, my children are here today. So step out of line, ladies. Step out of line. And that's when I knew that I could put these stories together in a way that would help tell stories that hadn't been told before. That's amazing. I remember watching that that same broadcast and, and hearing that and realizing that, that there was more to that story than, than what she, she could reveal in just the, the few moments she had, but um, not knowing that then we'd be talking about that same line and, and how it inspired uh, this book and hopefully will inspire others to step out of line and, and do their follow their own dreams. Well, I think there is definitely that lineup with this mm -hmm. book. 
And one of the other things I found in it is how so many people at that time were connected. Right. They knew of each other or they'd been in the same place at different times. They had other connections. And I didn't realize that in the beginning. And I was amazed to keep finding it all the way through this, that, that thread that continued not only with their connection, but how they left legacies and how it echoed down through the generations. So as you started collecting these stories, you eventually were, were doing some interviews with, with those who are, who are still with us. How did, you, how did you track people down? Well, I only found two who were still with us, although for many of the others, I found family members. And actually, I wrote this book very quickly. So I keep finding more connections now and more people who knew them or knew of them or ways in which they were connected. I signed the contract to write the book in January of 2020, end of January. They wanted the entire manuscript by the 1st of May. I had written nothing. And you know what happens in February is the beginning of COVID. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't access any museum, any archive. No one would answer me. No one would talk to me. And I was really concerned about finding information and sources. I started to buy books online from eBay or other sources. And it brought me back to original sources, which is always the best thing to do. So you get the story firsthand or as much as you can. Right. And many of these people wrote autobiographies in 1948, 49. And their voices then were different from what they remembered or told many years later. You know how stories get better over time and you add little things that sure. might not have been there in the beginning. <laughs> but I got all of their original voices and I found that to be the most helpful thing I could have found. And as you started putting these these together, um, as you were contacting family members or, or even those those who are still surviving, did your military background help you open some doors or, or at least maybe better understand the stories that they were telling that a civilian might not? It did, and it also helped me to know where to look, okay. uh, where to find things. And, and in reading some of the stories, you could tell, or I could tell, that they were written by people who didn't have a military background. So we're talking about one of the nurses, and then the nurses put up the tent. Uh, anyone who has put up a GP medium tent knows that is not an easy task. And to imagine 12 to 15 brand new nurses putting up this tent well, I can't think but anything about how that might have been quite amusing to watch in the beginning and probably for some time after that. But these nurses got the hang of it and they put up those tents when their combat units, their combat casualty units moved every 10 days behind, behind armor and infantry units to care for casualties. And they would put up the tent first for triage, then for surgery, and their own needs came last, always. And but they you, mastered it. Yes. And when you described the, putting up the tent, the, they, they put up the tent and took it down and moved it. It, it. Not like today's tents, which are nylon and very, you know, with the fiberglass poles and everything else. This is the heavy canvas, heavy poles. For those who don't know, how big of a tent are we talking? A GP medium tent would take all 15 of them and say it's half on each side. And the ones pulling at the corners first to settle them, pound the stakes into the ground, and then go all the way around. And these tents were heavy canvas. They smelled like mothballs. They were all treated to be waterproofed. And then sometimes there would be a small stove inside that they would have to be very careful with. Even when I started in the reserve components of the Army in the, in the late 70s, we still had those tents. It was still very much legacy World War II stuff that the reserve components had to work with. Wow. Well, let's let's dive into a few of the stories that, that you cover in the book. And um, and we can't cover the entire story as, as you do in the book. And I really recommend um, getting a copy of the book and, and checking out these stories because we're going to start with, uh, with a wasp, uh, which for our audience, we're pretty familiar with the wasp, but I was, I was not uh, familiar with uh, Millie and, and her story. Well, Olga Mildred Rex wrote Millie, 
Mm -hmm. joined the WASP in 1944. She had been trying for over a year to become a WASP. She had taken private pilot lessons. She had her license. And at that time, she was working in Washington, D.C. as a uh, clerk at was then the Army's War College. And that's Mm -hmm. at what is now National Defense University, downtown Washington, on the water, just up from where National Airport is. So National Airport was being built then, and she would sit on the back steps and watch the two planes take off from this this little airport and think, I want to be one of them. I want to be a pilot. I want to do that. I want to serve. And finally, she was accepted. She graduated in the class that was 44-7, August of 1944. So she only got to serve for a short time. So she planned for this for years. It was her dream, but it didn't last. Because it was in that fall when Hap Arnold decided, General Hap Arnold, that it was too difficult to fight Congress on this and the program was dissolved. So her dream only lasted for a few months, but she enjoyed every bit of it while it did. Um, When she first graduated, she was assigned to be a pilot who pulled targets. Now, as you know, the women in the WASP, the Women Air Service pilots, they flew every plane in the inventory. Right. And what she did was tow targets for ground gunners and air gunners. So you had to maintain your speed, or they would shoot the target off the back, or maybe shoot you. Mm-hmm. And so at first, in her first assignment, they shot the target off the back of her plane. She lands the plane. One of the instructors says to her, you see your target over there in the woods? Go get it. And she was, uh uh-oh. He flips her the keys to the Jeep and away she goes. But Millie didn't know how to drive a car. She could fly a plane, but she didn't know how to drive. So she's in this manual speed Jeep, and they watched her leapfrog that thing across the airfield to go go get that target back. Which was one of the stories she liked to tell for years afterwards. So as the program ended by that December... She she stayed in the Army Air Corps, and after the war, she transferred to the Air Force, and she became an air traffic controller. Hmm. She's buried now in the columbarium at Arlington National Cemetery, and I like to think that she's there where the roar of planes goes over there every time there is a burial, or she can at least be in the same place where there is all of this flight ongoing. Yes. And in the uh, the montage of, of photos you have of uh, Mildred, uh, she's wearing the uh, Congressional uh, Gold Medal. Yes, she was there in 2010 when that was presented. And in that photo, she is wearing it at a 4th of July event at Mount Rushmore. Ah, okay. And of course, we'd be remiss without uh, recognizing that uh, one of the original WASP, uh, Maxine Flournoy, uh, passed away just uh, about a week ago. Mm. Uh, and so the like all of our our world war ii veterans the uh the number of of surviving wasps continues to uh to decrease as well but we don't want to lose what they have left to us and we don't want to lose what that means to everyone who flies today right now i i met a few months ago a young woman who had picked up my book mm-hmm. while she was in the airport in new york in laguardia she's a flight attendant for delta and she had wanted always to join the Air Force and to fly. And she will graduate from OCS in Montgomery, Alabama at Maxwell Air Force Base here next month, and I will go to see that. Oh, wonderful. And our our mutual friend, Erin Miller, whose grandmother, uh, Elaine Harmon, was a Mm -hmm. wasp as well. She has just earned her a private pilot certificate, so we're all all very proud of her and and the the journey that she's been on uh, throughout throughout the years as well. And she told me that at first she didn't want to fly, and then it caught her. Yes. You know, the the thrill of flight. And I think that's what it is for so many who want to fly. Exactly. Well, let's move on. Our our next is uh, Stephanie Rader. And you mentioned, Stephanie, this is the the first story that you uncovered. It was the first story I uncovered. Uh, Stephanie passed away in 2017. And part of the story about her then was that she had never received an award for what she did in the war. She started out in the Women's Army Corps and then went into the OSS. 
Now, Stephanie grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York. Her parents were Polish immigrants. She didn't speak English till she started grade school. And so she spoke Polish perfectly, but she couldn't get a job after college. She had a degree in chemistry from Cornell. She was in New York City working for an oil company. And one of her friends said, well, let's join the Women's Army Corps. They're just starting up and it seems like the thing to do and maybe it'll get us a better start in life. And she said, okay. And so they joined up. They drove out to, what a garden spot, Fort Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> and Stephanie was put to work as a lieutenant working in basic training, meaning every six to eight weeks, a new group comes in, you teach them the basics, and then you start all over again. And she was bored with it. She wanted a bigger challenge and a way to make a better contribution. So when her friend said, well, why don't you just join the OSS? She said, hmm. So she applied and she was accepted. Now, most of what I've read about her talks about the time at the end of the war when she was sent to Warsaw, Poland, and her rating in the OSS was X2, which means counterintelligence agent. Mm -hmm. And she was there to report on the Russians, um, Nazis who were fleeing, what was happening with the upcoming elections and the rise of the Communist Party. And she did a tremendous job with that. She was in danger many times because she had no connection to anything military. She had to leave her identity behind. She just worked in the embassy. But what I found interesting about her later, and this is one of the stories I found after the book came out, was I got to watch a video interview she did in the mid-90s in which she talked about her first foray into counterintelligence. She was based in London just before the end of the war. And there she met her future husband, Bill. You see the, her picture there with Bill Rader. Okay. Now, Bill had been a pilot. He was a, he, he was a pilot in the Pacific. He did 17 sorties during the Battle of Midway and was shot down. He spent 20 hours in the water in a life jacket waiting to be picked up. And once he was saved, they reassigned him to England with the Mighty Eighth Air Force, where he became a commander of the 368th Bomber Squadron. He flew B-17s, and he was on one of the first raids into, the deep raids into foreign territory, and he, not, he returned after two of his engines had been knocked out and received the Silver Star in 1943. But Bill, didn't want to date British girls. He wanted to date American girls. And there weren't very many of them, which Stephanie thought was pretty good odds. You know, there are, what, 350,000 of them and probably 20 of us. So she was always out on a blind date, and one of her friends fixed her up with Bill. Well, he had to wait days to get to go out with her because she was always busy. And she didn't know who he was. He knew who she was. And he saw her on the street the day before their date with someone else. Mm. And so for years afterwards, he would tell people he picked her up off the streets of London, which she didn't appreciate much, but she came to see that was funny. So they were married for 57 years. Wow. Um, they got married right in September of 1945, right as she was going to Warsaw for that tough assignment. Then he was promoted to Brigadier General. And she was still in the Women's Army Corps, but he transferred her over. As he went into the Air Force, he said, well, I had to move you because you couldn't stay in the Army if I'm going to the Air Force. And so they spent their next 20 years as a command team all over the Air Force. Amazing. Now, we, we've just kind of glanced over one of the most important parts, at least in my reading of the story uh, of Stephanie Rader, and that is when she is in Poland and she's gathering intelligence. Um, as you as you mentioned, she's attached to the the embassy, but she has she doesn't have it really doesn't have a handler or any support team or anything else, and she's traveling around the country under the guise of looking for lost family members, which was a very common thing at the time. But she had some very harrowing near capture experiences as she was doing this and and I can't imagine doing this 
today. I I have no idea how she had the, the, the courage to do this, you know, back in the 40s. Well, there's no book. There's no yeah. Yeah. guidance. There's no reference on how to do these kind of things. She basically wrote the book on how to build an intelligence operation within an embassy and have staff to do it. One of the things I read in her story said, oh, the naval attache disappeared. Well, no, he didn't, because I read the ambassador's autobiography. The naval attache was driving a car along a bridge that had been destroyed in the fog, and he fell off the bridge. Oh. So I mean, they knew his name, they knew his family, but it was not as mysterious as some of the other pieces of information about this made it sound. Yeah. She was almost captured by the Russians at one point, and she just relied on her wits and her own abilities and managed to come off the train. She saw the Russians waiting for her. She tripped. And when she fell down, this nice man helped her up. And she said, oh, would you carry these for me? And it was all the classified papers she was bringing back from Berlin. And she walked away. Yeah. There's more to that story. You have to read the book. I'll just tell you that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and and the, the final photo is uh, obviously of her of her funeral. Yes, because the award she never received, mm -hmm. um, she had a, a what was then an Army Commendation ribbon. It wasn't even a medal. Now, I'm not sure why she didn't receive it. I think part of it was because the OSS was di disbanded at the end right. of the war, and there were so many awards to be processed that some just from that organization, because no one would check on it, probably weren't. Mm -hmm. And so for her funeral, a presentation was made of the Legion of Merit. So I have been to her grave, which is in Arlington, in Section 11 on top of the hill, right by the Air Force Memorial. Okay. And it says on there, Legion of Merit. Our next uh, featured story is uh, Elizabeth Robarts. And uh, the machine she is standing next to is something I've never seen before, but played a very pivotal role uh, in the war. Well, we read a lot about the code girls, the, mm -hmm. the women who worked in code breaking in World War II. There were 10,000 of them in Washington, Navy and Army. The Army code breakers were in Arlington Hall Station, and the Navy were downtown in what is now the Department of Homeland Defense. They were recruited for the Navy from Ivy League schools, and the Army recruited from teacher colleges looking for math majors or math professors. And so they were meant to break the codes for both the German submarines and then later the Japanese Navy. So Betty enlisted in the Navy. She wanted to join the Army, and she wasn't old enough. She was a college swimmer. She wanted to go to the Olympics, but in 1940, that wasn't going to happen. And again, in 1944, it wasn't going to happen. And so she told her dad she was going to join the military. And he said, all right, Betty, but you've never finished anything in your life. You're going to finish this. And she said, yes, sir. So she joined the Navy not knowing what she would do. She wanted to go out west. And she was thinking, you know, California coast, drinks with umbrellas. And she was sent to Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> so in Dayton, there were 350 so waves, um, the Navy women, and they were assigned to build the bomb machine, the machine that would decode the messages. She never saw a completed one. She didn't see it until their reunion in 1996, that, that, that many years later. And I did meet Betty. I talked to her and I said, listen, did you tell your kids? about what you did in the war? And she said, no, they never asked. I just wish I could have told my mom and dad. But while she was at sugar camp was what they called that base. They lived in little huts. There were six of them to a hut. And one of her roommates said, hey, I've got some friends in England. You know, my boyfriend's a pilot. And one of his buddies doesn't have a girlfriend. Would you all write to him? So all of them wrote to this guy. And then Betty kept at it. And so they wrote to each other for the next year and a half. 
and you see him there, that's Ed Robarts. Um, Shorty was what they called him. And Shorty was a B-24 pilot. He flew 35 missions while he was stationed there in England. He was close to where uh, Bill Rader was. I don't think they ever met, but they were close by. And one day he showed up. He called her and said, hey, Betty, I'm home. And this was in December of 1944. So as the WASP program ended and Millie Rex wrote and others are out of a job, the, the job of ferrying some of those planes from the factory to the front lines fell to the returning pilots. Right. Because the war was beginning to wind down. So Ed Robarts comes back. He invites Betty to come meet his aunt and uncle and spend Easter with them in April of 1945. So they finally meet in person. And two days later, he asked him to asked her to marry him. And she says, yes. <laughs> and, you know, of course, about the Mighty Eighth Air Force Museum there in Savannah. Right. Yes. And they, they volunteered there for years together. So Betty passed away just last year. And I have been there. I've seen their chapel, which is very much a British chapel mm-hmm. built east to west. Uh, with the stained glass all showing pilots meeting God. And they are buried there together in the columbarium, which is very fitting. Yes. And again, the the machine that that she helped create, uh, you, you can, we can see it in there. Uh, it's B O M B E is what's the, on the on the photo, but it was actually pronounced bomb, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it was originally bi- built by the Polish people to okay. decode. Um, messages. It's also the one that you see them talking about in uh, movies like The Imitation Game, where Alan Turing and others at Bletchley Park worked on it. And in fact, Alan Turing had visited Sugar Camp and seen the improvements the Americans had made, because there are 26 wheels on it, one for each letter of the alphabet. So what Betty did was work each day on soldering those wheels and putting it together. I think the first two were called Adam and Eve. Okay. And they weighed so much that they had to be taken apart and transported to Washington. But she never saw a completed one until that reunion Amazing. and didn't even know what it did because they weren't allowed to. It was so compartmented. And our next is uh, Katie Flynn Nolan. Well, we have to talk about the nurses. Yes. Of course. And. There were 56,000 nurses who served in World War II. But as far as others outside of the nursing corps, there were about 350,000 women who served. And that's in all branches and in all specialties. There were, there were photographers. Um, I did find a story about a photographer, too late to put in the book, who was with the 8th Air Force, who was assigned to print, develop, all of the photos taken of bombing footage. And she was also a photographer in her own right and stayed in the Air Force again for another 20 years, working all over Europe. But some of her photos are on display at Florida State University. And there is a a documentary about her uh, that is on, I think, PBS. And we'll show, oh, every year in March. So I've seen that a few times. But if you look up documentaries about women photographers, you'll probably find this woman. But other than that, there were the nurses who signed up in great numbers as they graduated from nursing school. And Kate Nolan, Kate Flynn then, at the end of her nursing school in 1944, signed up like most of her class did. And she ended up at MacDill Army Airfield in Tampa, Florida, thinking she was going to be a flight nurse because she thought that would be exciting. Well, that program was filled. So Kate got assigned to be a nurse with a combat hospital, the 53rd Combat Hospital Heavy Casualty, which meant going to Fort Bragg, watching the unit stand up, going from the individual training to the group training and learning things like putting up that tent, and then going to England and waiting to be called forward. So it was the 19th of June, 1944, when her unit is called forward. So she lands on Utah Beach 
just weeks after D-Day. Now, Kate's about my size, about five foot three. So uh, she's not exactly tall enough to make it onto the beach, come jumping out of that landing craft. And it was the taller nurses who had to drag her to the shore. <laughs> so, and their equipment didn't make it. So for the next two weeks, they had to assist other hospitals before moving forward. So they went from France through six countries. She earned five battle stars going all the way through to the end of the war. And one of the things I learned that I didn't know was that the combat hospital units were not able to stand down after Victory in Europe Day, VE Day. They were on hold waiting to see if they would need to go to Japan. So all around them, people are celebrating, ready to go home, and they couldn't go. But she was in the Battle of the Bulge. She talks about that in great deal, a great deal. And she went to reunions for Battle of the Bulge veterans for many years. I think one of the pictures you show of her there, she's wearing a medal, which is the French Legion of Honor that was presented to her later. Yes. Now, her boyfriend, who she met, in Tampa was James Nolan. He was with the Army Air Corps in Japan. So they had to reunite at the end of the war. Now she had passed away in 2019, but I talked to her children and her daughter Marianne was the oldest. They had seven children. Okay. So I would ask her questions like, Marianne, how did your parents get back together? I don't know, we will have to confer. Okay. So they would have a meeting between all seven of them, and then I would wait until they would call me back. And finally, after that question, it took two weeks, but she called me back mm -hmm. and said, we have talked, none of us know. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. So both Kate and her husband James are also buried in Arlington, mm -hmm. and I have been to visit them as well. And you know, it, the, this brings up a point that it's not just World War II history, but it, it's all family history. And I think we need to encourage people um, to explore their history and to ask their grandparents or great grandparents or even their parents and aunts and uncles about their experiences, maybe not necessarily in, in wartime, but but also in, in life so that you get a you don't end up with someone asking a question some years later and everyone in the family going, well, we don't know. Um, we don't know. Yeah. And I also understand that for many of returning veterans from, from World War II, it was um, it's the old story of the sailor who, who puts a, an oar over, the, over his uh, shoulder and starts walking from California inland. And someone said, well, how far are you going? He's, he said, I'm going to go as far inland as I can until someone says, hey, mister, what's that on your shoulder? And they don't recognize it as an oar. And he said, that is where I'm going to live. You know, totally putting... And, and I know that's just a, a story, but it, it totally putting that experience behind them and moving on. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's just it's just amazing when, and we've heard this from from other guests of who've discovered stories that families never knew, and it's just um, yeah, I, I guess it's just my my personal plea to, to remind folks to ask ask questions of your relatives. It doesn't necessarily have to be wartime or anything, you know, dramatic. Sometimes it's just as as easy as as knowing what grandpa's German Shepherd's name was when he was growing up, and, you know. Well, it also helps too if you have a starting point. Right. It's very difficult, I think, to say, what did you do in World War II? And, and then it's, oh, where do I begin? But if I was talking to Betty Robarts and I would say, so what happened when you first had your introduction to Navy discipline there in, in Washington? And she would say, oh, we got the lecture on you will not reveal anything we're telling you or you will be shot at dawn and I made the mistake of laughing <laughs> and then I got the lecture about you will not talk about this or we will shoot you at dawn and, and it was remembering that that was very serious right so I think it's it's having a starting point to say I understand some of this I just need you to tell me more and I think that's always very helpful so it's not coming at this from a place of total um, ignorance or not knowing mm -hmm. anything about their past. And it's true, too, that everyone who was alive at that time was affected. Right. Um, adults, children, 
those who served, those who didn't, because there were those who worked in the industrial complex. We have all the, the stories of the Rosies and how they volunteered. Some of them I met a few years ago, and they were 14 or 15 when they entered those factories. And they were small enough to crawl into the wings of the plane to attach the rivets. And I was fascinated with their dedication and what they were still doing. Um, one of them I met was named May Cryer. And at the beginning of the pandemic, she began to, to sew masks. And in the rosy colors, you know, the polka dot, mm -hmm. red and white polka dots, and sent them all over the world. So there's, there's ways in which they choose to still serve. And I think they still set an example for all of us. And for so many of these people, they had legacies. Um, Kate Nolan and James Nolan had seven children. All four of their sons served, and their granddaughter served in Iraq. So they have a legacy. They have service that echoes down through the generations and still has an impact. Indeed. It, the stories that we've kind of touched on tonight all have sort of a government military thread to them. But um, one of the, the stories that, that stood out to me when I read the book was uh, uh, Hilda Eisen. And the and that story was something I had never heard before. And the hardship and absolute tragedy that she went through to make it through the war. But then at the end, even though there basically was nothing left of, of her life before, picks up what little pieces she could and moves on and continues her life and ends up a, a very, very, very happy and, and fulfilled life uh, beyond the tragedy that was World War II. Hilda Eisen was the second story I found. Yeah. And hers too stayed with me that I wanted to tell it more and develop it more. I met her grandson and have talked with him and learned more about the family. Mm -hmm. So Hilda was a child, grew up in western Poland, about 75 miles west of Warsaw. And she was 19 and newly married when the Nazis came into Poland. Her entire family was taken and put into a ghetto, and she and her husband escaped. She escaped three times. She escaped that first time while they were on the run for weeks. Then they too were captured and put into that ghetto. She talked a guard into letting them out. Oh, I have to go out and do a little shopping. Just open the gate. And they were gone again and moved into the forest, one of those deep forests where the sun never reaches the ground. And they spent the next three years there fighting the Nazis as partisans. So those who served, not, not served in a military sense, but who fought on a personal level, really were affected by that war in ways that touched them for the rest of their lives. Yes. So Hilda was captured one day while out in the forest looking for firewood by a Gestapo patrol and taken to their headquarters, which was an old schoolhouse, up to the second story. And she knew that she was going to be interrogated later. And it's that same spirit. She'd already escaped twice. And she said, I will not take this. And she jumped from the second story window and then ran. There were guards. They shot at her. Uh, perhaps not very well or with any real intent, but she escaped, climbed over the fence, and ran throughout the night to get back to the forest. By the end of the war, her husband had been killed. So she finds her way back to her village, and there's nothing left. None of them knew what had happened. They didn't know where everyone was. They didn't know anything about the camps at that time. They just knew they're gone. And there was a boy there who she'd remembered from junior high, and that was Harry Eisen. Mm -hmm. She didn't care for him much in high school, but he was all that was left of what was her past. And they decided to go forward together. They managed to find their way out of Poland because the Polish people would have killed them, into Germany, and lived in a displaced persons camp for two years. And I think about those two years of what do we do? Where do we go? How do we find a way forward? There's no food, there's no jobs, there's no way. And finally, she finds a distant relative in California who sponsors them to emigrate. 
and they end up in Orange County, California. Here he gets a job in a hot dog factory because it's all he can get because they don't speak English. They're learning English, but it's not that great. By December of that year, 1948, they have their first child. And there's a knock on the door. That knock on the door brings back the five years of that past where they were pursued, they were hunted, they were afraid. They don't answer the door. They look through the curtains and wait till they see people leave. Then they open the door and find that their neighbors have brought them presents for the baby. And to me, that's the moment when they decide they are able to go on, to go forward, and to create that new life. So they save their, their pennies, and they buy some chickens. And Hilda boxes the eggs, and Harry sells them off the back of his bicycle. So by the time they sell that business in 2002, they had 800,000 chickens, 450 employees, and an annual income income of 110 million. They were the largest egg producers west of the Mississippi. And absolute humanitarians and philanthropists. So if that isn't overcoming, not even overcoming, but creating new life, new hope, right. I don't know what is. Yes. And and again, that that story brings us, you know, here in the United States, we either through memories or newsreels, books, movies, whatever, the, the experience in America was not, I don't want this to sound wrong, but it wasn't that difficult compared to Hilda and, and others in Europe who just were under, in ex, just completely circumstances that, that we can't even grasp today. Uh, but to read that story and then the just, you know, the, the drive that they had to finally make their way, you know, to the United States. And then, of course, it becomes the American dream. Well, look, they, you know, brought themselves up by their bootstraps and, and had a, a $10 million a year uh, business. But they had already been through the worst that life could throw at them. So I, I would think at that point, it's just the worst has happened. It's got to get better. And uh, it certainly did for them. I think that's true. The worst has happened. Mm -hmm. And we have a business sense. We know how to go forward. It's yeah. just, can we let ourselves trust enough to do it? Yes. And I yeah. think that was the hardest part for them and for so many who found such devastation after the war. And for for them, it wasn't, well, let's just go home and get on with it. Right. For so many, it lasted years until they were able to even begin to make a difference and go ahead. We have a, a few questions from our, our audience. Uh, one of our viewers is wondering, how did you choose the people for the book? How did you choose the stories? I could have chosen so many more mm -hmm. um, and wanted to. There were some that I couldn't find enough information on. There were some I found afterwards that I wish I'd found earlier. Um, for the most part, if you read the book, you'll realize that so many of these people live to be of 100 which means I found them as they passed away. So certainly there are so many stories of people who did amazing and incredible things who died much earlier, and I may not have found those. Um, I wish I could certainly add more to the stories I did find. Well, with the, one of our other viewers is asking if you do mention that there are, there are other stories. Is there, is there a part two to this book coming? Well, I could wish that. Um, <laughs> I do think my publisher might have other ideas in mind. Okay. So there is a follow-on book that is not about World War II or about these, this group of people or this cohort. And it's about women who were in policing in New York City beginning in 1915. Oh, okay. Well, one of my friends said, you ought to write about my grandmother. You won't believe what she did. And so she's telling me the story, and I'm going, tell me more, give me more, yes. give me more. Awesome. Is that book available, or is it still to be released? It won't be released until August 8th. Okay. Um, and it's called The Girls Who Fought Crime. Nice. 
it, and is that something that people can, when it's ready, they'll find it on your website, Amazon? Uh, I think it's sites? on Amazon now. It can be oh, pre-ordered okay. now. Okay. They actually sent me one last week to look at. So. Okay. <laughs> How does it look? It looks really good. Um, <laughs> it doesn't look as large as this book, but then it's fewer people. Okay. But, you know, several of the stories... Uh, have the uh, the OSS thread to them, and, and I didn't realize were there there must have been a great deal of women who who served with uh, OSS during the war. There were, and it, within the OSS, it was probably more of a, a meritocracy. So they didn't have the same us and them concepts that you might see in some of the other organizations of the time. Mm -hmm. In the OSS, if you were competent, you were good. I have a couple of the other stories. One one is of Virginia Hall. There's quite a bit that mm -hmm. has been written about her, but from the standpoint that she was a spy. And to me, from my Army background, she was a special operator. She trained others for guerrilla warfare, and she trained French um, partisans to fight the Germans in southern France and keep them from reinforcing the Germans in northern France at D-Day. And she received the Distinguished Service Cross for her role in combat, which means that's the second award. That's under the Medal of Honor, just under Medal right. of Honor in precedence. And there's also the Cartography Division. There was many divisions of the OSS that survived after it was disbanded at the end of the war. But it was also the first time that maps were used for intelligence. One of the things in, in the book is the very last chapter, and I wanted to ask you about that because the last chapter is, is titled No More Firsts. Well, I think it's time for us to move beyond the first woman to do this, the first woman to do that. and It's cohorts now where we see, um, let's just normalize all of this, where it's whoever is picked is the one who can do the best job. And we don't have to think about, oh, it's the first person, who, the first woman to be this kind of a pilot. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first women who were fighter pilots. We should be past all of that now. We should just be normalizing whoever can do the job well is the one that is selected for the job. I think we're getting to that point, but it certainly seems to have taken us quite a while. Yeah. And again, reading all the stories that lead up to that final chapter, when you, you read that, it's like, you're right. That This shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a big deal anymore. We should... As you said, whoever is the best for the job, go do it. Um, you know, male, female, whatever background or, or ethnicity, we should really move beyond the, the firsts. There's always those who will rise to the top no matter mm -hmm. what they have to fight or how hard because they are extraordinary in themselves. And then there's the rest of us who, who need to have the playing field leveled so that we can actually have the opportunity. Right. Any final thoughts on, on this book? I feel like I know these people yes. by now. Um, and I don't know them as old ladies who did things a long time ago. You know, in writing this, I met them all when they were 17, 18, mm -hmm. 20, and had no fear. Well, we know we don't we hate the Nazis. We're gonna let the air out of the tires of their bicycles. Ha ha ha. And then see where it goes from there. And so it's following them in what they learned and how they learned it that I think is instructive and it teaches resilience, it teaches leadership, it teaches what you learn in a crisis because the Army saying is that the crisis doesn't teach character, it reveals it. And so for so many of them, they, they did the same thing that Hilda Eisen did. I will not take this. And I will survive. And I think that's what I learned from all of them. That is some insightful, insightful words. And when you mentioned it, I, I, I felt the same way. I, when I was reading the book, I didn't feel like these were older women telling their stories. It was the 17 and 18 or 24 or whatever. It, it was, it, I, I, was transported back to the to when they were 
doing what they were doing, whether it was being a spy or, or cracking codes or, or being an army nurse. And I, I think that's a, a tribute to your, to your writing style as well. Well, I wanted to attract a new generation to read this and not go, ugh, World right. War II, that's back there with the pyramids. Well, no, it's not. It's yesterday. Yes. It's yesterday. And in terms of the legacy that we have now, it goes back to the changes they wrought, the things that they did and the things that they brought and told to the next generations. Well, as we wrap this up, one of, um, one of the other things that I discovered on your website is that you have written several other books, including <laughs> a series that, um, and our guest of honor didn't, didn't really make, a, make any noise tonight, did he? Uh, well, That's... no one rang the doorbell or you would have heard uh, <laughs> schnauzers on the, on the attack. And, and Mary is a is a is an animal rescue uh, person, uh, an animal activist, and she has three three little ones that uh, were making a little noise before we came on the air, but uh, have been very quiet tonight. But the the first Benson book, A Thousand and One Places to Pee Before You Die, that the title of that book alone <laughs> got me. Well, you know, he can't read very well. That's what he thought it said. Um, so I had adopted this little dog from an older couple who gave him up because he was a wild puppy. And then they felt guilty and they wrote to him. So he wrote back. And it got to where I had 75 people on an email list for his latest adventures. So I turned it into a book. <laughs> and then I donate everything from those books to animal rescue groups. Oh, wonderful. And then uh, Party Pooper, that's why I invented Moo, or invited Moo. Well, I was Maggie, the second schnauzer. Mm -hmm. But I would go to my college friends first grade class and we would be pen pals with the kids and show up on the last day of school and then when the school district didn't like the title a thousand and one places to pee before you die i just said well then they're really not going to like the second book right and these books are available uh, as well on uh, all just about they are any place that sells books right including your your website yes so if, if folks would like to visit your website and uh, find out more about uh, all that you do, in, including uh, you've got a consulting business and your, your motivational speaker as well, and uh, also serve on the Army War College Board, uh, the foundation, and uh, you, mm -hmm. you manage to keep yourself busy. I do. You know, you got, it's a lot of dog treats you got to buy. So That's, That is so very true. Give us the uh, website address, if you would. Uh, well, it's it's my name, MaryKayEater.com, or it's Benson'sReview.com. Either one works. I go to the same place. There we go. Mary, thank you so very much for, for joining us. Um, before we sign off tonight, any anything you'd like to add or anything that I've missed? Well, I just wish I could have seen you all and, <laughs> you know, been been there in person more. But sometimes you're the windshield, sometimes you're the bug. And today I was both, I think. <laughs> there you go. Mary, thank you again for, for being a, a part of our, our show tonight, and it's going to wrap things up for this evening. Uh, if you have any ideas for a future topic you'd like to hear about, send Leah Block an email at media at cifhq.org. Until next time, from the Commemorative Air Force, I'm Steve Buss. Have a good night.